Okay, Walter is joining us, and we have time for some questions for David and Walter. Don't get shy now. I, I have a question for you about the software you're developing to do the analytics, which is very impressive. Um, and I think at Leuven you have uh, an open source institutional repository to store the content. Um, do you mean the technology for the repository or that there's open source material in our repository? Well, I, I guess my question is, um, are the tools that you're building to do the actual analytics available to others or are they just custom things that you're developing? Uh, the, the problem with the uh, repository at Wageningen is that it's a homegrown system, so it's not a DSpace, a Fedora or an ePrints uh, software system, so it's not applicable. But the methodology I'm willing to, to share with you, and I've given many presentations uh, uh, explaining it, so if you just... Yeah, that would be useful. I think. Yeah. Uh, that's a question for Walter. Uh, the co-citation analysis you were doing, I thought it was interesting, and my question really was a little bit about your method. So you were looking at people who were citing different journals and then you were saying three people did this or two people did that. Were your journals only those that you subscribed to or was it the full world of, of journals available to them? Because no, that would really affect your results. The limitation is that we are using articles published in uh, journals covered by the Web of Science, so that's the limitation. But then we did a complete analysis of the reference lists based on the Web of Science data. That's a bit of an arduous task because it's normally it's a mess, so you need to do a lot of data cleaning before you actually can do any analysis. But then all the journals mentioned in the reference list are included in it. And one of the things I didn't mention is that if you, for instance, ask for an, uh, uh, a multidisciplinary journal like PLOS ONE, then it comes up with all kinds of alternatives to PLOS ONE, but not PLOS ONE itself. Uh, same for nature or science or class, these kind of things. But so there are also even really small journals that only a few researchers use. We show them the co-citations of the, journal, the other journals mentioned in relation to that journal. And so that's not necessarily a Web of Science covered journal. A question, I think, uh, primarily for uh, for David, although I'm, I'm certainly interested to hear from both of you. Uh, David, you, you made a special reference to, to Dartmouth's very strong brand in undergraduate uh, education, and, and I'm wondering where you see the digital commons providing uh, repository infrastructure that reflects that part of Dartmouth's brand, so the degree to which uh, that repository infrastructure also supports faculty in managing their teaching and learning objects in a context where there's growing attention to uh, examples of pedagogical excellence. So that really can be a kind of uh, brand leader for, for Dartmouth. Dartmouth. Yes, on, on, on a uh, parallel track, we're part of edX and have thrown ourselves fairly heavily into some MOOC development um, uh, this last year. Um, the Um, I should probably just speak for myself. I mean, my assumption, uh, and then I'll explain why we haven't really worked this out, but my assumption is that um, we will very quickly see some of that MOOC-generated content as um, material that for archival and other reasons we want to safeguard. Uh, if any of you have done this, you'll know that the um, production standards are really quite high. That is, if you want a credible MOOC, you put a lot of money into making sure that you have, um, you have on-screen experiences that are professional. They're also, to a degree, modular. So as we look at some of these, one of ours is on opera, 
um, another's a sustainability science one. We can already imagine reusing some of those modules in, in other settings and maybe in a future MOOC. So, um, so there's a lot of, of, I think, core assumptions that that material will be managed in a repository. It's somewhat out of scope uh, at the moment. So we're really sort of running on some assumptions that will perhaps by year three um, become um, instantiated in the actual work. <clears throat> it, was, it was clear to us, to us all, I think, that in order to, um, that we really needed to manage expectations. So in addition to some real service, in, in, in addition to some real service excitement, there's also some infrastructure nervousness. You know, this is new to us. We have metadata specialists, but they haven't engaged in some of these issues. Um, we have very good programmers, but they haven't been part of the Fedora Hydra open source community. So, so for, um, yeah, for, for good project reasons, we've been quite circumspect about what we're promising beyond the things we think we can do successfully. I would, I would guess that by year three, by the time we're creeping towards this simply being an operating piece of the infrastructure, that, um, that we will have uh, a fairly rich array of content in there, including um, not just uh, the teaching materials that come from the MOOC side, but um, uh, you know, as we hang our shingle out, we're hearing from people in, in um, graphic arts who've got huge CAD programs. We're hearing from folks who have um, not really data storage needs, but, but um, data conversion needs. So they, they've got a bunch of stuff they'd like to use. It's in a format that's not contemporary, and they want to know, could the repository you know, wash that stuff through and have something better come out the other end? Um, which it certainly could. These, these are all services you can build on this infrastructure. We're also, not surprisingly, hearing from faculty, um, predominantly in the humanities, who are very excited about putting their stuff in. It's perfectly in scope, it's just in print. So you know, their first question is, do you have a data conversion service? that will allow me to put this thing in. And we're building that partnership with our university press. So we're essentially using them as a vendor. Um, and we've been testing this with some, with some Dartmouth um, books that become e-books. And I think that, you know, that's gonna be a very frictionless uh, workflow once it, uh, once it ramps up. So the, the focus isn't there. Uh, we also haven't talked very much about undergraduate scholarly research. But certainly that, that is you know, part of our focus on undergraduate work is, is you know, genuine undergraduate um, research. And students have an option to do a, a final thesis. You know, we, we keep all of those just as we keep our PhD dissertations. And I suspect in probably in shorter order that material will, will simply come in scope. Is there any thought about um ways to assess uh, impact of teaching, you know, faculty performance in teaching rather than in research? Uh, only, no, is the short answer. <laughs> with, with this particular project, there's plenty of other discussions going on about, uh, about that, that, but it doesn't, it, yeah, um, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's helpful with some of these new things where there's a, a, uh, yeah, a fractional suspicion around the edges that you're really up to something else that uh, you, don't, you don't try and blend everything in together. So we're trying to be as, you know, as, as clear as we can in our marketing about what we're doing now. There's, there certainly is, a lot, of course, lots of interest in new ways to evaluate. We're, we're um, not just in the, the online space. Um, uh, there's a very lively conversation about student uh, reviews of no. teaching and, should that, and how public should they be. Um, you know, should, they, should they simply happen on servers the students control or should they somehow be sanctioned, and what does that mean? Um, Other questions? Uh, sorry to have two in a row. Uh, uh, this one, I, I think, uh, perhaps more, more uh, fit to, to Vautra's circumstance. I'm wondering, in the in the uh, context of attention to uh, European scale research priorities, the Horizon 2020 program, the attention to 
pan-European collaboration, a collaboration between research institutions uh, within, say, the Netherlands or the Netherlands and elsewhere, how, how that might affect the way you think about uh, reporting requirements, business requirements associated with, uh, with the institutional bibliography, if you will. So, so in, in a world where we're measuring institutional rank and reputation at an institution scale, my institutional brand, it's sensible to be thinking about the output of my, uh, my local scholars um, in a context where there's a greater expectation of deeper cross-institutional collaboration in long-term research projects. I wonder how you think about building that into your, um, into your methods and metrics in as much as surfacing that collaboration, that long-term research program happens at a level above uh, any one, any one university. Um, especially at uh, Wageningen, international collaboration is really a, a, a big part. If you look at, imagine Wageningen is a city where there are only 37,000 people and we have 160 uh, different nationalities uh, in, in that city. So it, it, uh, internationalization is a big issue. Uh, certainly very important for the university. Um, and it's, I couldn't possibly show everything, but uh, mapping these kind of uh, collaborations, uh, making visualizations of, of the existing networks and developing networks is, is one of the things we, 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 we are just starting, but it, it's, it's up to the people in Wageningen to, to continue that. And it's, it's also uh, in my, um, uh, at my new university, they have strong um, GI science uh, department. So these are also on the basis of bibliometric uh, uh, information, get all the affiliations there, do the mappings, show the collaborations. That's really one of those uh, um, um, really interesting things to be uh, active in. With regards to uh, adherence to, well, compliance to uh, EU uh, policies, of course, it's a natural place that you, uh, the researcher knows his projects, etc. So in your current research information system, the researcher is active in certain projects. So whenever an output comes along, he has to make that connection. And it's only the researcher who can make that connection between his project and his output. But after he has made that connection, it's up to the library to make sure that he complies to the rules set by the EU. And so it goes to open air and, and, and will be uh, uh, available there as well. And, and these kind of things. That Those are in that bracket of no-brainers that we do. It's a service which is so natural that we don't even have to talk about it. Oh, but that they all were. <laughs> <laughs> but then what would we talk about? That, that still takes a, a bit of work to, to, to get <laughs> in that position. <laughs> Any last questions? <clears throat> So this is for Walter, but, but maybe also for the, for the larger group. Uh, the, these bibliometric measures, they, they, they work very well in the STEM fields, uh, maybe not so well in the social sciences, but are applicable. Uh, where I, I struggle to understand is how, how they can be best applied to the humanities and to the arts, especially the performing arts, where we have a number of distinguished faculty. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on that, or, or anybody, if, they, if they're really good examples of how those have been applied, where the faculty are happy with how they've been applied. Well, <laughs> <laughs> this is actually one of those challenges I didn't uh, have the time to, to answer uh, while winding down. It's um, in the Netherlands, certain universities have looked at what we're, we're doing at Wageningen and always got the message like, well, in Wageningen it's easy, it's a life sciences university, so uh, there's it's, it's easy, no worries. Uh, still, it was a hard sell, uh, uh, a hard sell in uh, social sciences to get this type of approach there, but I was lucky and, and the, the, the circumstances were right and we could uh, roll it out over all of the university. Um, one of the challenges I find interesting and why I made the switch to another university and start from scratch again is to show 
that it can be rolled out at a general university as well. But don't start in the humanities, but uh, uh, show you can pull it off in, in, at the medical uh, faculty or the, the, the science faculties and, and these kind of things. And then get buy-in from this part of the university to uh, um, uh, encroach the humanities as well. Don't go to the humanities and say it has to be done like that, but show them what at least is known about their impact and, and things and, and, and start a discussion and where we can improve and, and, and then uh, build on further relations. I think altmetrics are going to play an important role in, uh, in, in that respect. Um, different outputs, different impacts, uh, um, hopefully they can help us to um, uh, make it easier for humanities as well to ac accept certain forms of registration and impact measurements, uh, not necessarily on the basis of uh, um, uh, citations, but, but other things. We, we, did, we really do have to be nuanced about how we do this, because you can, I mean, I think there are some real opportunities you know, um, for the humanities, but um, you, know, you can very quickly end up, as I'm sure you're very aware, with, with something that just generates a lot of resistance and misses those. Um, one of the, um, yeah, one of the great assets that the library has in these discussions is that we, we um, have a library, whatever you call them, liaison, subject specialists, departmental uh, librarians who are often very, very close to the faculty and who are trusted. So they're a terrific sales force for these sorts of ideas and often you know, a good individual to um, thinking of the power to convene from earlier on to, to actually convene some some you know, interdepartment discussions that are you know, entirely exploratory, um, uh, hopefully you know, politically safe. Uh, um, so, uh, so we do we do have some good ways of, of engaging um, broadly in that conversation, but but it really isn't a one size fits all. Uh, and isn't it the case that a lot of the middleware and citation sources are just not there for the humanities? Definitely, yeah. yeah. They're certainly not there for automatic harvesting. Yeah. There are other ways of getting right. the things in yeah. there. But, yeah. A last question? It's, it's more a comment. Uh, Susan Lafferty from UNSW Australia. Our uh, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, we, we've got symplectic, so we, we want to people in humanities and social sciences to add their publications, etc. The associate dean research in the faculty sa simply said, if your publication is not in that system, it does not exist, we will not recognise it, you will not be recognised for producing it. And it wasn't, the, it wasn't the library, it wasn't central admin, it was within the faculty, they just said, if it's not there, it doesn't exist. Well, that's it. An interesting note to end on anyway. <laughs> um, so, we've come to the end of the day.